They don't. They want the original four piece. I was going to ask you about the sort of comeback. Obviously, they came back with Rhino and Jeff. Andy was still there on keyboards, ironically with a very big hit single that they didn't write in the army in the army now. Um, and then that was also going to be part of my question. I believe Jeff was involved with you guys at that time because we have top of the pops footage where people like Kenny Jones are standing in for Jeff. And I said to the guys, "Why is Kenny Jones sat there?" Oh, Jeff we Leopard. Mm. Jeff Leopard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, status quo were on tour, but coincidentally, or it could have been really clever planning by both theirs and our managers. Every day off, gig day off, was a gig, gig day on for us. So Jeff would be flying in and out of England. We were based in Ireland at the time, and we were doing shows in places like um, some th theater, some cinema theatre in Limerick and then a, a club in Waterford and then an end of pier uh, like roller skating rink in Ballybunion in County Kerry um, and then we were finishing off at the RDS in Dublin for the big one you know it's a 1200 kind of standing basically vomit kind of auditorium but um, it was down in Ballybunion um, where Jeff couldn't make it that he got fogged in in Manchester or something the flight wouldn't take off and he came, we weren't even due on stage till 11.30 at night because we had to wait for the disco roller thing to finish before we went on. And in fact, we had to stop sound checking to let them in, which was hilarious. But uh, Jeff, you know, the two kits are set up and we've got to go on and there's no Jeff, you know. So by this time, Jeff had been playing and ghosting Rick's parts for three gigs, the three or four gigs. And Rick just felt, oh, well, maybe I'll try it on my own, see what it's like, you know. And... Um, so we started the set off without Jeff and 40 minutes in, a very sheepish Jeff Rich sneaks onto his kit and joins in. And I, I remember turning around to get a, a drink and towel down. And like, oh, welcome home, you know. And um, long story short, when the gig had finished, he says, you know what? He says, I watched from the side before I got on. He says, I think I'm not going to play tomorrow night when we did this gig in Waterford. And Jeff just stayed out front and watched Rick. And after the gig, he just came in and said, I guess I'm going home tomorrow. And that was the last time we ever saw him, except for the odd, you know, backstage "How you doing?" moment when he was still in quo. But um, he was no, he was a very integral part of of what we were doing. It was a really good launch pad for Rick's comeback. We'd would be forever grateful to him for that. The continuation of them, I suppose. Oh, what are we doing for time? We're all right. We're good. Minutes. All right. Okay. Continuation of them, I suppose, is that you know they're still they're still indoors. They're still doing the sheds. They're still. Um, supposedly selling records um they've done a few sort of various publicity stunts over the years to help that move four gigs in a day that kind of thing coronation street two obes why do you think we're still so fascinated with this rock and roll band i think the fascination for call is just the fact that they're survivors you know everybody loves a survivor um i, I you know i often read all this nonsense about cliff richard and i just think it's hilarious it's like banning him from Radio 1 and his fans getting all these petitions together to, you know, you just, there are people, they don't come out of woodwork every day, they don't s write that many letters to their MPs and stuff, but there are just tons and tons of people out there that love this band, they just love the quo, you know, and, but they've got their own lives, so they have to delve in, and I think what it is, again, it goes back to that subconscious thing where you don't even necessarily know it, but if you're a fan of a band like Quo, you've come to accept the fact that they're kind of just part of the fabric. They're always going to come round and play. So you always have their records. You don't go and miss them. You kind of think, I know they're going to come back. And you get on with your life, you go, but work in your factory, you go work in your office. And then you come on, jacket off, denim on sort of thing. And you're just waiting for the moment that somebody rings you up and goes, have you heard? Well, they're coming to the Gaumont. They're coming to the City Hall. They're coming to the arena or whatever, you know. And then, you know... It's you relive in your youth. That's what it does. You know, bands like Quo and anybody from that era, with the Stones, McCartney, it's a chance for us to celebrate what you invested your time and effort into as a teenager. And it's, it's it solidifies that thing, that, that, that choice you made. It makes you feel good because you know you made a good choice. It's like being married to the same woman all your life. You made a good choice. You've picked this band. They're your band or one of a dozen bands that, you, you, that you're... Desert Island disc favourite sort of thing. And the, the, they're still around. You're still there. You love them. You even love the stuff that you don't like because it's them. That choice that you made back then, 
you feel good about it because you know you made the right decision. You know, it's like they're still there. And that vilifies everything that you've fought for when somebody going, oh, I've quote a crap. No, they're not. They're great. And you're going to fight in the toilets of some pub. You know, I mean, we've all done it. You know, whether it be over Slade, whether it be over T-Rex. I used to get beaten up at school because by Slade fans because T-Rex was a puff. You know, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, can't you like both? You know, these decisions that you make to go, you know what, I, I'm glad I made this choice because Electric Warrior is still a great record and I still love Slade, you know, or, you know, Quo. I, I don't listen to the new stuff, but I bought it and listened to it for a week and then I go back. It reminds me to go and play Pile Driver or Quo, you know, or Hello again. That's what it does. You know, you, you have to forgive artists. Even McCartney has made crap records. But then he comes back round. 2005, he brings out Chaos and Creation in the Backyard and it's, it's like work of genius. And it's like, OK, I forgive him the frog chorus. You have to forgive Quo in the army now. You have to forgive him everything from Mystery Song. If, you know, depending on what, where you stand in your... Everybody has a different level of, that's my cut-off point, you know. Um, but it's all based on the beginnings. You know, let's be honest, even with the Stones, they're still capable of putting 100,000 people in a stadium from London to Peru. But all you really want to hear is Jumping Jack Flash. You don't want to hear anything off voodoo lounge but you have to forgive them and they have to be able to breathe by putting new music out into the ethos and hoping that something takes off it never will because the the world's moved on it's changed and the stones can do a brilliant song like out of tears from five or six years ago good as anything they ever did nobody cares something that we go through all the time something that quo are going through with any new music they make which is why the publicity stunts have to happen. They did four gigs in one day. We did three continents in a day. It just gets the press to look a little harder. You know, I mean, I was, you, Lady Gaga wears a bacon dress. Why? Gets her on the front page of every paper in the world. And that, sadly, has become more important than the actual music that they make, which is sad because she's actually quite good. You know, Quo are easily capable of writing another Down Down, another Caroline, another... Roll over, lay down. Whether they ever will or whether they'll be accepted is not their fault. It's our fault. Final question. We did touch upon it earlier. Obviously, as you know, just before Christmas, we got the original four back together at Shepperton Studios and did a bit of a jam session and recorded some stuff for the end of the film. What do you think it would mean to fans if that got to Hammersmith or Wembley? It wouldn't get Hammersmith. It did have to be moved. It would probably end up at the O2. I, I honestly think... I think that if they put the lineup back together and put a British tour on at the right time, which could be... I mean, certain bands need the Christmas thing. Lindisfarne being a perfect example. Um, maybe for Quo it wouldn't matter, but I swear to God, if they put the original lineup back together, they would sell out the O2 Arena in London. 21,000 people, no problem. They'd be able to headline Oxygen. They'd be able to headline, you know, any of these big festivals, download, whatever. It would absolutely just... It's the thing that everybody's... Every Quo fan on the planet is waiting for. You know, I mean, look, let's be honest. I think that the highest they ever got in America was fourth on the bill at the Day of the Green. Um, it wouldn't mean anything that side of the big water. They don't care. They gave that dream up years ago. Concentrate on Europe. That's their big thing. That's what Queen ended up doing. Um, for us, it's the other way around, you know. For Quo, I, I swear to God, I, I think they'd be they'd be selling out in hours, if not minutes, if they did that. It's what everybody wants. Yeah.